Hello everyone, my name is Julian Myers and today I'll be talking to Paul Mullaney about our current topic of adulthood. This is that interview show. Hello Paul, welcome to our show. Hi Julian, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Alright, uh, now our main aim for this show is to talk about adulthood, which you are a part of, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep. Okay, so to s kick off this awesome set of questions, which I always have in front of me because I can never memorize anything, um, what is your current occupation? I'm a school teacher. Some people, audience members, won't know that. Just, oh. it, there will be a banner there saying that you are a school teacher. I am, high school, I am so. a school teacher. Yeah. Um, what is your area of expertise within being a school teacher? Um, area of expertise or what I, what I teach. I mean, um, I teach English and philosophy and literature. Okay. Um, why do you teach literature and English? Because um, I enjoy them. Um, because I think that they're valuable things for people to know. Yeah. Okay. And which of the two do you prefer? Like more than the other, if you want to. Well, I, th I think that um, I, I prefer literature because it's a more technical subject. Mm. Um, but I think uh, English, the kinds of skills that you learn in English are fundamental to becoming a good citizen, and I think that's what mm. <laughs> that's what the purpose of an education is, and so that's. I guess that's why I teach those two subjects. Was it always your plan since high school to teach no, these subjects? I hated, I hated school and I hated teachers. And um, I think the very last thing I wanted to do with my life was to spend it teaching kids in a classroom. Yeah, I have that thing too. I think it was also business and civics a couple of years ago. We had a sack that was pretty much, what was it, CAD. And one of the questions was, um, what's your most like the most hated job that you don't want to do in the future? And mine was being a teacher, because I can never, I can't put no. up with. There are people who, who, who uh, particularly little girls, who grow up their whole lives, they want to be teachers. Um, they play schools, um, they love their teachers, they write love letters to their teachers, and they, and they, uh, that's all they want to be. But when I was a kid, uh, the last thing I wanted to be was a teacher. I despised my teachers, I did everything I could to make their lives miserable. Um, and strange circumstances led me to being a teacher almost against my will. Okay. So, it wasn't deliberate, Julian, at all. Not surprised there. Uh, why exactly, so why exactly did you end up getting to, coming to teaching? Um, well, my original plan was to become a, a, a rock musician and play guitar. Um, yes, I've been there too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I worked in a guitar shop for a long time, um, and as I worked in the guitar shop, um, it started to dawn on me that every man just played guitar. If you're at school, could you and, come to the uh, office, please? Many of them better than I could, hmm. um, and uh, it also struck me as I met older musicians to be a, an industry that retards people, that emotionally and intellectually people are retarded by the music industry and. Um, I got scared by the consequences of staying in that line of, of work. Um, and so my dad said to me, because I had a, a number of degrees in various things, um, none of which I had any intention of doing anything with, I just did these things out of interest. Yeah. Um, he said, hey, if you go and do a teaching degree, I'll pay for it. And I said, okay, it's another year of university, why not? Yeah. Uh, and so I went and did that. and. Uh, And then I started being offered interesting jobs. So yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a plan, and it was completely against all of my ambitions. But I ended up doing quite a good job at it. Yeah, well, as a student, I can definitely agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably been, if not the most interesting teacher I've ever had, one of the top three. Well, that's not bad. I'm in the I top mean, three. That's good. Yeah, I, I can put you in the top two. That's for sure. Um, not as a like oh because you know you're right in front of me now I gotta say it but no it's because you are definitely one of the probably the best teachers well, I've um, had. 
other people said that to me. I think that's maybe because I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, maybe it's because of my trajectory and I have a different perspective on things than other people do. I don't yeah. know. Um, would you prefer to teach anything else? Well, I mean, the, the, thing, the thing that I'm most interested in and most passionate about is rhetoric. Um, the thing that I spend most of my time reading about is um, the, the art, skill, science of, of persuasive language, how it works. Um, it's history. Um, because to, to me, it's, it's, it's a fascinating field and it inflects everything. Mm. Um, so it's, 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 it belongs in philosophy, it belongs in English, it belongs in literature. Um, it's, a, it's a way of understanding the world that just appeals to me. And so if, if I could teach anything exclusively, that's what I would choose to teach. But uh, in the world we live in currently, it's not... Um, not valid? It's not that it's not of value, it's sort of been broken up into various little pieces and stolen by different disciplines. Mm. Um, and, I mean, if you take VCE for example, uh, all of the, the, the tasks and all of the understandings you're asked to, to uh, demonstrate are all rhetorical understandings, mm. you know, rhetorical analysis, rhetorical composition. Um, it's never mentioned, <laughs> but it's embedded in those tasks. And to do well with those tasks, you need to have those skills. Mm. And the well, saddest thing for me is that Swagger. those skills aren't explicitly identified and they're not explicitly taught. Mm. And so we have this weird situation where you're asking people to demonstrate skills that aren't taught. Um, you don't teach them the language <laughs> to do that, 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 that work in. Uh, and the assessment doesn't include that language. The teachers themselves don't understand those concepts. Mm. And so the entire project, to me, uh, could be included simply by teaching kids rhetoric from prep all the way through. Um, so if I could teach anything, that's what I would teach. I can't teach it, so I embed it in everything I teach, as you're probably aware. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, so when, when we look at uh, texts in class, we talk about schemes and tropes, and we talk about structure, and we talk about arrangement, and we talk about all these other things that are rhetorical concepts. Because when you have those concepts, and you can probably again attest to this, it makes understanding and talking about these things much more straightforward. Um, so that, that's what my goal would be, to have a, my own little rhetoric class somewhere in the world. But it's never going to happen, Julian. Could optimism is valued, I guess. Could be. I look at things more realistically, personally, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I don't really need to ask what occupations you've had previously. But is oh, I can, I can tell you if you like. Or is there any further occupations you've had previously to teaching and working in a guitar shop? Well, I've done a million different things, but I mean, I've done other sorts of teaching. Um, I mean, my, my first teaching job was working in prisons. Mm. Um, okay. So, so again, it's, it's strange. I, I did a teaching degree and never intended to teach. I just took my dad's money because it's another year of university. Um, but I, I met this lady at a party who said, you seem like an intelligent person. Would you like to go and, and tutor sociology? I said, yeah, sure, I can teach that. Um, and uh, she said, it's at a prison. And I said, okay. Um, and so, it was interesting for me because I'd gone to private schools, quite a few as you're aware, and, and left them under interesting circumstances. But um, I had a very, very um, insular view of the world. I'd been protected from the world and all its vicissitudes. Um, and I was confronted with poverty and disadvantage. And um, the, thing, the thing that shocked me most about prison was the lack of education the illiteracy um, and how that affected people in terms of their development as people. Mm. Um, so their inability to articulate ideas, their inability to have agency in the world was all down to the fact that they hadn't learned anything. They couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't speak, as a concept they can't think. Mm. Um, and so after that, which was fascinating, um, and I didn't teach them sociology, I ended up just teaching them how to read <laughs> because they couldn't read. Um, I started working in programs uh, in Geelong with kids who'd been expelled from school and they same problem, they couldn't think, they couldn't analyse, they couldn't articulate their ideas. 
And so that's where all this rhetoric stuff comes from. Yeah. And the stuff of the, my, my passion for language and thinking and arguments comes from because, uh, see, a lot of people think of education as being um, vocational. You, you, you go to school and you learn things because you develop a career path from those things. See, I don't, I don't have that at all. I think that's a complete mistake. I don't think education is at all vocational. I think that there's an element to it. I think education is about developing yourself as a person. It's about citizenship. It's about being able to think, express yourself and interact with agency in the world. Um, so this is probably why I'm different to other teachers in many respects because I don't think that the whole I'm going to do business management or I'm going to do law or I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be a... I don't care. I care whether you can think. <laughs> Mm. I care whether you can understand the world. Um, I care whether you can express yourself. Um, and all of those things have to do with language. And once you teach someone that stuff, they can, they can basically do anything they want. That was probably a digression, but there you go. Yeah, well, it's very interesting. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, would you change any of your... <laughs> Anything in your past? I'm thinking of just all the things that were done with digital reason. Would you change anything of your, in your past to to fix or to help benefit your current situation and position as a teacher? Well, as as you know, which and we won't discuss this here. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. um, I did lots of dumb stuff as a kid um, because I didn't know that there were consequences. Um, I went to private schools where you were protected from the outside world and you're protected from the things you did. And then when you do things that um, that put you in danger of losing those things, you don't understand that that's a risk. Um, and so I, I had to learn some very hard lessons as a kid about um, uh, taking responsibility for things. And so I think I think had I been raised differently and, and in different environments maybe I wouldn't have taken some of the risks that I took as a kid. And maybe... Uh, and the thing is, Julian, that, that when... What you don't understand as a kid is that the, the decisions you make as a kid influence the decisions available to you as an adult. And the interests you develop and the paths you take in life. And so maybe had, had things been different in my childhood, I wouldn't have been who I am now. So, I don't know, it's a complicated question. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Oh. Um, so, do you consider yourself to be an adult? I mean, as society would put it, you are, as of legal age and whatnot. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I struggle with this because um, I don't actually feel any different and have never felt any different ever since I can remember. I've always felt like me. Um, I've become more conservative as I've got older. But I don't think, I don't feel like, I don't know what an adult is, for one thing. I'm not sure what that means. Mm. Um, if that means being mature, I don't think I'm very mature. Um, if it means being responsible, well, I'm not particularly responsible. Um, so if, if I'm an adult, I'm a fairly bad one. Um, I'm certainly older and more experienced and maybe a little bit wiser than I was when I was younger, but essentially I don't feel very much different. Mm. Um, I imagine that I'm, when I'm 150 years old on my deathbed, I think I'll probably feel pretty much exactly the same as I do now. Again, with more experiences and, and knowing more things, and, but um, growing up for me has really just been growing older. <laughs> Sorry. That's, no, that's... I don't have any wisdom to impart. I mean, that's... <laughs> I, mean I, I think I got the same answer pretty much not as detailed as an answer, but I got kind of the same thing out of Kai, because he even, he, and he's only 19, he even said that, like, nothing's really changed. It's all it's, oh, well, it's things, the same. Things change, you, I mean. You have more, you know, stuff that you can do. But the, 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 one, the, the one thing that I think, here's, here's something, here's a point. One of the things I have noticed is that if you have children, it does change things. I have um, many friends who have children. I have many friends, adult friends, who don't have children. And I think the one, the one thing that altered me more than anything else was having 
to make sacrifices for other people. That's, and I think that that changes the way that you relate to other people and to the world. Whereas people who don't have children don't have to make those sacrifices. They can live these very narcissistic, selfish lives. Um, so in terms of maturity, that's probably the, the pivotal moment is having children and thinking, you know, I have to actually do things I don't want to do for the benefit of other people. Um, and that becoming a habit. Because that's that, as far as I'm concerned, that's not that's not native to my personality. I'm a very selfish, narcissistic, egotistical person, as you probably. You know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can I can agree on that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't really consider. I don't know. It depends on if you, if you do like being this way that you are, of being as narcissistic and well, however. I'm, well, as I'm saying, I'm not. I'm, I don't think that I am as narcissistic and egotistical as I as, used to be. Yeah. I think that um, you know, this is the thing. My, my life has been a constant chipping away of that of that arrogance and that narcissism. But it's 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 who I am. It's, it's yeah. you know, built into my soul. And so, working in prisons stripped away a lot of that. Working with kids who have been expelled stripped away a lot of that. Other schools that I've worked in, um, I worked in a school where there was lots and lots of Aboriginal kids, lots and lots of poverty. Um, that strips away a certain amount. Ha having kids changes it. So it's, I, I think constitutionally, it's part of who I am. But I think if there's a maturation process or a growing up process, it's been that um, refining of, of who you are mm. and, and, and a mellowing so that maybe I'm not, if you met me when I was 17, I'd be a very different, I'd still be me. Yeah. But it'd be a much more hardcore version of me. You know what I mean. It, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been mellowed by getting punched in the face a few times, mm. which I think is necessary to your development. It's very important to be punched in the face yeah, because you're being a dick. I've been punched in the face for not being a dick, but I that's was. that's where it matters. It matters that you're being a dick, and someone says, "I'm holding you accountable for being a dick." Here's a punch in the face for your for your, for your trouble. I think I'd be more afraid to get punched in the face because I wear glasses. Oh, like, okay. I don't want. I'm okay if I get punched just without my glasses. <laughs> I'm picky about that. Uh, I mean, it's the only thing that's really stops me from functioning very well as a person because I have this disability. So I'm like, yeah, I don't want it's that. Not a disability? To be. Having bad yeah. eyes? I, yeah, but I don't have better eyes than others. I have worse eyes than others, better eyes than some others who are blind. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, to a perspective, but it's not. It's not the best. It's not the most valuable thing in life. But <laughs> I mean. I don't know if you complain about having glasses or not. No, what, I, what I complain about is, as, here's, here's another thing about getting older, Julian, that you'll discover, particularly because you wear glasses, is that as you get older, your eyes get worse. Um, I used to be able to draw. I used to draw all the time. I mean, I, I was very, very arty and creative. I can't do it anymore. Um, I, I, can't, I can't draw. My, my, uh, in order to draw, I have to put my eyes wide up against the paper. Um, I can't do it. So. Uh, I can still read, mm. but I have to have special glasses to do it. And because of the way that they change the way I see, I, I can't draw. Um, I can, it's just not very good. <laughs> so your eyes get worse as you get old. There, there's a good thing about being an adult. Yeah, well, I was going to fit in with the next question. What are the challenges of being an adult? <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've covered them. I mean, there's a lot of... There's a lot of, a lot of um, I've been taught, there's a student in the school who's, who um, I, I spent a lot of time with, talking to who's lost his, um, a member of his family recently. And I think that's, that's part of growing up, loss. Yeah. Loss, pain and suffering. When, when you're a child, you, I think you imagine that every day is Christmas Day and the, and the school holidays never end and wagon wheels are this big. Um, but... Um, Adult experience is different from that because adult, adult experience is always coloured by the fact that there's ugliness as well. Um, I'm not not all childhood experience is lovely, but many people's childhood is lovely. Yeah. Um, and progressively over time, you have more and more ugly experiences, and you have to incorporate those in um, and make sense of them in, in terms of this entire thing called life. And you know. Over the course of my brief life, a lot of people have died, and there's been a lot of suffering. And you know, and um, so you know, that's how it works. Um, 
but that's it's, it's not a bad thing. I mean, we talked about Nietzsche in class and how um, without suffering and difficulty, there's no progress. And I think progress is a really important part, whether you're maturing or not. I mean, progress in terms of learning and, and development, um, that's really, really important. And that really only happens with challenge and difficulty. So that's a good thing about growing up. Growing up. Yeah. So the, good, the good thing about ageing is um, that all those things we're talking about, all the things that other people say, oh, it's terrible that people die and it's terrible that you you know, have relationships that break down, it's terrible that... Well, yeah, it is terrible. Yeah. But you're able to, if you're able to incorporate those things in and make sense of them and use them as ways of growing, then they're ultimately good things, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Bit of Nietzsche. <laughs> bit of Nietzsche doesn't hurt no one. No, nah, bit of Nietzsche never hurt anyone. <laughs> Actually, maybe we can see that, because um, you, when it comes to in, in class and literature, yep. uh, you're very big on philosophy. With with teaching, like with with, with analysing certain novels and whatnot, with like philosophical um, yeah. perspectives and whatnot, um, and you even said you you, you teach uh, philosophy. Do you teach that here at, at school? Yeah, I teach it in year ten. I've taught it in year eleven and twelve elsewhere. Okay, um, you bastards in year ten. <laughs> well, with philosophy, the, it's, it's a year eleven subject next year. Yeah. So what's the question, that's, Julian? That's good. Um, yeah, um, I guess the question really is. is um, do you think philosophy should be taught more in yep. schools like this? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, but it's like I said before. I mean, I I don't think education is vocational. I I mean, it is. Okay. I don't think at its heart it is. I think at its heart it's about forming young minds, forming citizens. Mm. Um, and I think that part of that is being able to think, analyze, understand the world. And you can spend as long as you want learning how to program a computer. It doesn't teach you how, how, how to make sense of reality. Yeah. It doesn't teach you, you know, what exists and what doesn't exist. It doesn't tell you how to value things. It doesn't tell you the right way to behave. Now, I think they're important things for a kid to know. Mm. Um, philosophy teaches you that stuff. English doesn't teach you that stuff. You know, maths doesn't teach you that stuff. Science doesn't teach you that stuff. Philosophy does. Now, philosophy is embedded in all sorts of subjects. Yeah. But in some ways, as a teacher, I would like to think that young people are being taught how to think, how to make sense of the world, um, how to value other people. And philosophy teaches us those things. So, but the reason we learn in literature isn't necessarily to teach you those things. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's because um, those ideas are an important part of analysing those texts. So we talk about Christina Stead. Yeah. If we don't talk about Nietzsche in Christina Stead, then I think we're missing something really important in the man who loved children because that's, I think, and she also says, <laughs> that um, this is what the text is, is doing. So if we don't talk about that, I think we've missed a really important method of understanding what the text is doing. Yeah. But I, I think you should do philosophy at university next year, Julian. You'd love it. It's fun. Yeah, well, I've I'm trying to take it up as a hobby to, the, to study. The only bad thing about philosophy at university is the classes are often full of middle-aged, like mature-age students who have just too much to say about stuff. So if you can endure that for a couple of years, it gets good. Yep, wouldn't hurt. I mean, been surrounded by people that age at the high school for, and primary school for years. So I mean, I've, I'm, I'm okay with talking to teachers. But I can't yeah, be okay with talking to students that are at the same exactly. age. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which ways we can see that? How do you how do you see teenagers? Like, do you like them? Are they? I spend my day with them. I mean, well, yes, you do. So. Um, how do I see? I, I, I see teenagers as half formed people, and um, that's not a negative judgment. But I, I, what I see is, is people who are learning to be people. Yeah, because it's what got yeah. more. And they've got yeah. a, and, and, there's that, and there's that stuff of, of suffering and learning and experience and disappointment and all the things that you have to have take on board to be a fully realised person. And I think um, I, I, I like spending my days with kids. I like watching them learn things. I like their faces lighting up when they, they go, I understood something. Um, so if I didn't like teenagers, Jul Julian, this would be a bad gig. Um, yeah. Now, again, I didn't know that I liked teenagers. <laughs> you know. Um, 
this this was something I discovered quite by accident by doing these different things I did. Um, but you know, I, I discovered that it's fun watching kids <laughs> learn stuff and get better and better, um, and they seem to like it too. Um, some like it more than others. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it makes me see the um, when it comes to I guess with maturity with teenagers, uh, how some are considered more mature than others. Is it? Do you think you know like how they? I think over the generations and decades and whatever they've had things saying like oh teenagers are bad you've got to change them and do all this kind of stuff but even with your consideration of that they're still growing as people do you think it's it's an, it's annoying or stupid or anything that they're so targeted because well, we're still growing people I mean. you go back to ancient Greece the people were always complaining that the young were doing something wrong mm. that the young were challenging whatever the established moral codes or dress codes or the, the accepted behaviours were. And that's one of the jobs of teenagers is to challenge the accepted modes of behaviour and mm. push boundaries. Now, what they don't know, this is the big secret, is that those boundaries are soft boundaries. They're not really things that, that once you push them over, the world's going to change. Or So one of the, the jobs of being a teenager is to push against the restrictions that are placed on them. But they're artificial restrictions and they're easy to push over. They're there to help you grow. Yeah. Um, so, I, I love the fact that kids are rebellious. I love the fact that kids will, will flip the bird at, at, at authority. Um, that's the job of the young. The job of the young is to be passionate and committed and have a very black and white view <laughs> of, of right and wrong and to fight for what they're passionately believing. Um, and if we could talk about maturation and development, part, part of that again is, is it's not growing up, it's understanding that black and white aren't things, mm. that what we have is greys and, and learning to negotiate this, this very different world of finely shaded variations rather than this and this, because mm. kids think there's this and there's this, you know, there's, there's what's cool and what's oppressive, um, and that's exciting, it's fun, it's cool, it's, it's great to be in a classroom with people who think that way, because you can change their way, the, the way they think, you can, you can help them see that they're alternatives. Um, but I love, I love teenagers, I, I love that they're rebellious, I love that they're excited and enthusiastic. Um, so, I don't know whether that comes across in clubs. <laughs> um, I might just come across as some, you know, boring old windbag, I don't know. I personally don't think so. Well, that's I mean, that, that's I, fortunate. Yeah, well, but then again, just my opinion. Just your to opinion. Compared to other 15, 20 odd people in our class and others in your English class and whatnot. Yeah, um, <laughs> fun question when I was asking you the other day about our hood. When, when do you truly believe? Well, actually, I don't think it's, no, I don't think that's really necessarily the idea of when do you truly become an adult, an adult. And I've already asked, do you believe yourself to be an adult? Um, the answer is I don't. Really, yeah, well, I don't. whatever an adult is. I mean, when, when you get to be as old as me, like 150 years old, I'll ask you, and I'll say, "Do you feel like you're an adult?" And you'll go, oh. "Yeah, probably." Um, I guess. Uh, wording. As an adult, do you uh, do you believe that? Would you have much recreational time? Yeah, Probably. I have lots of recreational time. Um, um, got enough time to read quite a few books every week, just play my guitar all the time. Um, so I've got plenty of time to do whatever I want. Okay. My, my job is not oppressive in that sense. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've always, I've sometimes thought that it, can, that it could be for some teachers, because I've always had like, oh, there's heaps of students have homework that they have to correct and whatnot, and so it's always a big deal and about that kind of stuff, so it stops yeah. them from having their own freedom. My auntie was like that. My, my auntie who died recently was a primary school teacher for her entire working life. Mm. And she always seemed to have this mountain of work on her table. But I think ultimately she, she liked having that <laughs> mountain mm. of work on her table. Because you, it's very easy to manage things such that you don't have a big mountain of work on your table. Um, we have plenty of time to plan, plenty of time to mark. And if you come to work a little bit early, 
and spend you know a little bit of time at home. This this you know it's not it's not an onerous job at all. Hmm. Okay. Um, if you I guess like if you had additional recreational time that you could do something different to what you usually do, what yeah. would you do? Um, the same as I always do, just read more books. Um, play my guitar more, hang out with my kids more. Um, I mean, the, the, the things that I enjoyed, Julian, have always been the same things that I've enjoyed. When I was your age, the things that I enjoyed doing, reading books, hanging out with my mates, playing loud guitar music, listening to music, they haven't changed, they're the same things. Um, one thing is, there is one difference. I have noticed as I've got older, I don't crank my amp anymore. So, so I, I've become conscious of neighbours. Um, when I was a kid, everything was maxed out. Yeah. Um, now I, I, I'm very, very conservative. I never turn anything up very loud, and I buy amplifiers that are very quiet. Um, so, there's there's one difference between being a kid and being grown up. As a grown up, you th you think about other people's needs a bit more. Um, I for empathy. <laughs> is it empathy? I don't, know. I don't know. I don't. I don't even understand how empathy half the time. It's no, I don't know. I, well, I know what it means, um, and I think I feel it, but I'm not sure. I suppose, but let's, it's it's a considerable thing. Like, does is it? I guess maybe okay to be cruel because it's it's okay to be yourself. But even if say you're you're not as you know empathetic with people, or you're more. A robot than you are a human, as people say. Is that a really big issue at all? Like, I don't know. I think there's a. There's, we live in a world where there's lots of expectations about how you're supposed to behave and how you're supposed to think and how you're supposed to feel. I think the the the, the key requirement is to feel, think, and be authentic. So try and be true to yourself. Now, if you don't feel something, I don't see the reason to pretend that you do. Yeah. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try and like empathy is important for relationships. Mm. Yeah. Unless you have empathy, you're a sociopath. Um, but I don't necessarily feel all the emotions that other people think that I should, or that they claim to. Um, and I'm quite happy with that. Okay. Yeah. You've got to be true to yourself, Julian. Yeah. Maybe I just have a limited range. I think that other people have a big paint box sometimes, and I've just got a little tiny... You know the ones that the, the poor kids have got with like three or four colours? Mm. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mm, that's all right. Yeah. Um, how old are you? Uh, old. Description: old. Yeah, I'm old. Teacher is old. old. Yeah. That's all you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> Just makes me think. I mean, is there is there really is there much to look forward to being being an adult? Oh, yeah. I'm trying to not look at the pessimistic side, but more of there is stuff to look forward to. Just trying to. No, look but, uh, as an as an adult, as an older person. There's everything to look forward to. One thing, the anxiety of being a teenager goes away. Yeah. Um, a, a lot, a lot, I remember being a teenager. Um, there's always this uncertainty about who you are, where you belong, you know, whether this is going to happen or that's going to happen. Just, does this girl like me or not like me? Mm. Are these, am I cool enough to be these kids' friends? That all goes away. Um, and instead, what you have is you, you become more and more content with who you are. Because I remember that horrible feeling of, of feeling dislocated and feeling um, lost in the world. And I think that's, that is the teenage experience of not really knowing whether you fit or how you should fit. And as, a, as an adult, whatever that means, um, you're a lot more confident in who you are and, and you don't apologise for it anymore. You don't think I'm cool? I don't care. <laughs> but as a kid, it was a really important thing. Am I cool or not cool? Am I accepted or not accepted? As an adult, whether the people in the school, for example, think I'm a cool person, I couldn't care less. I'm me. <laughs> and I'm happy yeah. to be me. And I think that's, that's it's an important transition. And I think that as you get older and you have these experiences and you, know, you have relationships and you go, oh, that one didn't work and I'm still alive. Um, all of, that's still nature stuff, you know. You go through these various stages of life, various things happen to you, and you come out the other end as a fully formed person. And that's what I'm talking about teenagers. Teenagers aren't fully formed per people. Why? Yeah. Because they haven't had those experiences. They don't have that sense of themselves as being, I'm Julian. 
and I don't care. Um, and I'm so, I'm myself. I don't care. I don't think, <laughs> but that's being a fully realized person. It's you have um, an authentic identity. You are you, and no one can take that away from you. As a teenager, I think that's under siege all the time, and it's it's not just externally; it's also inside. You're not you're not really sure who you are. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's kids, am I straight, am I gay, you know, um, am I a, 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 a cool sort of goth kid or am I this kid, am mm. I, you know, what should I wear, what should I read, is this the right music to listen to? As an adult, that's all, for most people, Yeah. Um, I think that gets resolved. So that's cool. Yeah, I guess I can hear that. So you'll like I, it when you get there, Julian. Yeah, I, I think I've always... As a kid, even I was, and I was like, I, I want to be, you know, I want to be older, I want to be taller, I want to be more mature because I want to be more of an adult so I can do more things and not have so many eyes looking on me to be like, oh, you got to make sure you're doing this right, you got to make yeah, sure you're doing that. Yeah, that's a weird thing because I remember, the, I remember that same feeling of someone's always watching me, like someone, whatever I'm doing, someone's scrutinising me to see whether I'm okay. Mm. No one's watching you. This is one of the, the, the weird things you discover, that you believe you're being scrutinised and judged. No one's doing it. So you, you sort of, oh, I can't wear this because people look at me and think I'm weird. No one even gives you a second glance. That's life. The truth is, most people just go about their lives. Yeah. It's useful information. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, thank God I'm telling it. <laughs> it. Yeah, basic as that. I can, you know, I can understand that. That's why I like doing this show. Okay. I, I like I like seeing not just people's different perspectives on things, but also seeing how I guess just how they how they feel about things and how they see things. And if what they believe is true is true and false is false, like even what is it, Nietzsche's believe like there's there's no there, there is no facts, it's only interpretations. So like. Well, that's I mean, I mean that's not just Nietzsche. That's I think there's um that that's. I think it's a given. There are no facts, <laughs> um, but there there are certain things that are probably more likely than others. Yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. Because even I was like when I first read, like, are you sure there's no facts? I mean, like, I think I think things are pretty true, but well, but let's not let's not get into that one because that'll take us a long time to, to work through. Yeah, I think that's one just to keep in keep in your mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's pretty much it. I've even gone off script with questions. That's I like when I do that sometimes, just go off script with questions. Well, that's good. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's pretty much everything I have. Uh, so, thanks for being on our show, Paul. Well, I'm very happy to be on your show, Julian. I hope you, that I had something useful to contribute. Well, if not to them, definitely to me. Oh, that's good, yeah. that's good, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you all audience, people on the camera, right, for joining us. Uh, my name is Julian, Paul Mulaney has been our guest. Um, Zach is supposedly behind the camera, you won't know that. And we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Goodbye. Thank you, that was fun. Yeah.